Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens webinar, Let's Talk Gardens. As always, we ask you to put your questions in our chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Manager of Education and Collections at Smithsonian Gardens and it's always my pleasure to introduce wonderful speakers for this series. And today we have someone that I know you're going to enjoy hearing from, Matthew Ross, who's Director of Continuing Education at Longwood Gardens. And I'll let him do the commercials and tell him or tell you more about himself, but I can't recommend strongly enough to go up and visit Longwood at some point in your life. It's fabulous. In fact, I should say in some points because it's always changing and just like Smithsonian Gardens, you need to be there for all the different seasons. I recommend Longwood and the many, many public gardens of Pennsylvania. So Matthew, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us more about what you do at Longwood, but also then how do you botanize? I'll see Sounds you in good. a couple of minutes. Bye. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia, and I want to thank the whole team at Smithsonian Gardens. It's a real honor to present to your audience today. Uh, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, I am the Director of Continuing Education at Longwood Gardens. And uh, a little bit about Longwood uh, and why it's such a magical place is because it is the living legacy of Pierre DuPont, and it's a place that you get a chance to experience magic in the forms of performing arts, like our beautiful fountain gardens and in incredible uh, mixtures and combinations of plant material through our rotational seasonal display that you see right here. And we're probably best known for our formal gardens and our ability to have a different look every time you visit. But one of the other aspects of the gardens that is a little bit uh, unsung hero, uh, or is the unsung hero, is our meadow. So in 2014, we reopened this 86 acre majestic piece of Southern Chester County landscape. And it is a garden, it is one that's managed and uh, it's also one that's explored like our students are doing right here. And that's kind of a great segue into the fact that today we're gonna to be focusing on field botany and how being out in the field and being able to identify plants and understand their role in the landscape will help you be a better gardener. Just like we're seeing right here with one of our teachers, Arden, getting ready for a class this weekend, we offer a lot of different educational programs to help you uh, expand your knowledge of the natural world and then utilize that knowledge to become a better gardener, a better professional, and just a better steward of the world. So I've had the pleasure of botanizing all across the globe, places like the beautiful and majestic redwood for forests, to the caves, and beaches of the Dominican Republic. Domestically, I travel often, but one of my favorite places is the New Jersey Pine Barrens, a place not far from where I'm at right now with one of the most diverse plant communities anywhere in the world. Here you're noticing the pygmy pine forest where these old, old, old pine trees are only three, four, and maybe even five feet tall, a real oddity in the plant world and an exciting place to see everything from the pines to themselves to things like these beautiful little drosera or our carnivorous sundews that thrive in lean soils shown here. I've also traveled as far north as Acadia National Forest where I just spent time earlier this week looking for the perfect yellow tamarack and some of our fun uh, exploring uh, was going through the uh, mountainsides, the cliffs, and the bogs that were illuminated in red and yellow as the rem last remnants of fall color were still on display. So let's talk a little bit about what is field botany. And if you look at botany in general, it's one of the oldest fields of science. It has its roots in herbalism, and it's mainly because we were determining what might be edible, poisonous, or have a utilitarian use. Theophrastus is known as the father of botany, who is thought of as an inspirational founder of modern bot botany with his compendium Historia Plantarum. He's not alone. There were many other manuscripts that focused on the importance of plants, including the Hippocratic Corpus. So some might argue that botany 
was our gateway into medicine as well. And while you're probably familiar with some of these names of prominent botanists, the likes of Carlos Linnaeus, Joseph Banks, Thomas Nuttall, Gregor Mendel, and Alexander von Humboldt, just to name a few, I think it's important that we also pay homage to those that have been pillars that are not as well known, like Raphael Moscoza, Janaki Amal, Humphrey Marshall, Mary G. Henry, Agnes Arbor, and many others. But you don't have to have a fancy degree. You don't have to be a university professor to become a botanist. And I encourage you all to think that you could become a botanist, much like the Sarahs, the, the famous Smithsonian Sarahs that take care and tend to the gardens that many of you are familiar with along the mall in DC. But it's important that we also forget, don't forget about the next generation, like my little nephew here, that once he found a hoary pacoon on the sand dunes of Lake Michigan, he knew exactly where to head the next year to see it in full bloom. I hope that you all encourage uh, yourselves, your family, your friends to get out and enjoy nature and get a chance to look a little bit deeper into the plant material that you're surrounded by. I used to mention with my students when I was a professor in Ohio on their first day of plant identification class, you're gonna love me because you'll never be able to see nature the same way. And you're also gonna hate me because you're never gonna be able to see nature the same way. And I hope a little bit of that rubs off with all of you today as you take and look through a different lens. So hiking. Hiking, one of the greatest activities that you can do to catch the free air around us, to go out and experience nature. But hiking is a little bit different than when, you, than when you're with a botanist or when you're, when you're with a horticultural professional because botanizing is a little bit different than hiking, as you can see here with the executive director, Ethan Kaufman from Stonely. It all depends on your focus and intention. Are you going out there to expand your general knowledge? Or are you doing something called a botanical blitz to see as many plants as you can in a specified time frame or location? Are you conducting an official plant survey? Or are you achieving your own botanical bucket list? And I encourage you all to have one if you don't already. I know mine is pretty chock full of some rare and unusual plants uh, that I'm excited to see someday. And maybe you're part of community science efforts. When you're botanizing rather than hiking, distance might not be the true goal, and you're normally not as fast paced. So if you want a little bit more relaxed experience out in nature, uh, bring along a botanist. And speaking of that botanical bucket list, here's my friend Todd knocking off one of his lifers, a plant that is truly fantastic. I know you're probably thinking it's got to be the red sticky pads of that Drosera or Sundew but it's actually not. It's the curly foliage of this curly fern right next to it. One of the more rare plants that you'll see in the Pine Barrens and a joyous moment for an amateur botanist. Well, it's important to know the ground rules first and making sure to, that you stick to the path when you have to. Collect samples only when permitted. And if you're gonna be collecting samples, one of the best spots to do that is natural lands within private land. That's ideal for collection of seeds and herbarium specimens. Otherwise, you'll need permits and know the rules where you're at. It's important to wear orange during the hunting season. Uh, you might not be the only ones out there. Uh, I oftentimes take advantage of the beauty of the state game lands. And during this time of year, they're reserved for hunting and nearby trails and paths. Uh, you best be wearing orange while you're out there. Uh, do not poach. And uh, I highly uh, uh, want to just let you know to avoid broadcasting locations of rare and sensitive plant communities in case if someone else would want to act uh, inappropriately and poach from the wild. What I mean by that is just taking a photograph, there's metadata that's associated with it that can give off your geographic location. So it's really important that if you're going to be sharing the location of sensitive plants, that you do that to a closed group of individuals. Um, and ultimately, we just want you to have fun when you're out there. So what gear should I bring with me? 
Well, one of the most important things is knowing where you're at. Um, I oftentimes bring my cell phone with me uh, and rely heavily on its maps. But one of the big things that I do is I actually take a screenshot of where I'm at on a topo map so that if I was to get lost or lose cell reception, which happens often when you're in remote areas, I then try to uh, look up where I'm at on a topo map, which provides uh, some uh, clues as to where you might be. I also use the All Trails app uh, very heavily. Every time I go out, I have certain uh, markers I want to hit. Uh, I try every month to hike at least 50 miles out in nature, uh, and it can be a very helpful app to use. However, it will drain your battery. Uh, so it's important uh, to know exactly where you're at and take pictures of any maps that you might see or any trailheads so that if you were to get lost, you'd be able to find your way back. It's important definitely to wear boots. And I mean, waterproof boots. Uh, the last thing you want is to have soggy feet the entire time you're out hiking. And again, just a reminder to wear orange. That could be hats, sweaters, jackets during the hunting season. Uh, my parents are on today's call. So uh, they would be very happy for me to say this because I don't always follow my own rules. But if you're in an area where there's a lot of bears, make sure to bring bear spray or a deterrent and make sure that you're not provoking any wildlife. Field guides, really important thing here. So you have pocket field guides. You also have websites that you can use and then references for your car. So I'm a big fan of Drosera and Saracenius. So I might bring along the New Jersey guide of Drosera and leave this in my car rather than bring it with me. But I definitely, uh, if I'm going out and wanting to look for Saracenius, uh, for instance, I don't think I'm gonna bring this five pound book with me. I'll probably leave it back in my car and then look for something that might be more approachable like a pocket guide. Um, you might even be interested in the mosses, not just the plants around you. So you might wanna carry a small um, guide here that is color coded on the inside. This is common mosses of the Northeast and Appalachia. I also have it where it is uh, in a nice jacket around it and keep it in a special pocket while I'm out in the field. So there's great references out there. Um, for those of you that are near uh, me in Pennsylvania, there is the Pennsylvania Flora, great guide, but something I probably wanna hike with. It's also important to bring a camera, a sketch pad or a journal to catalog your experience. And if you're collecting specimens, then keep a press in your car. Hand lenses or loops are very important if you're trying to speciate out um, different um, plants. And then a friend or friends are always optional. Definitely make sure you bring enough water. And I like to have some of my uh, favorite little friends like Gritty there uh, along for the ride as I hike in different areas. The other benefit of having an orange hat or an orange jacket is that it creates great color contrast when you're trying to show how deep purple the Drosera really are. And if you are gonna be collecting, make sure you have the right equipment. Here I am again with Ethan uh, with a hook that we use to gather up some uh, acorns from uh, Quercus alyssifolia up in the northern Poconos just recently. And the camera that you have in your hand is the most important camera that you brought along. So whether that's a DSLR or a iPhone like John Mannion and Jenny Evans here, it's also important that you might want to use your hand as being part of the exercise here to help with focusing in on things like Tillandsia, Bromeliads, and other epiphytic plants. Also remember to bring snacks. I know that I can't hear your laughter now, but I know some of you are probably laughing. Uh, but if you don't bring your own snacks, you can always borrow some from mother nature. And if you're out in a place like the Pine Barrens or other locations where blueberries are abundant, uh, it always helps to have a fresh food source nearby. And there's nothing sweeter than being able to have the taste of your own foraged food. Now I mentioned the pocket guides and some other resources, but two that I really wanna mention are the Virginia Flora. There's an amazing app for that. And I believe Zach is gonna be adding that into uh, the chat box. It is a paid app, but it's one that has a pretty good range of plants, especially if you live in the mid-Atlantic and is a great uh, reference to carry along with you on your phone. And as much as it pains me as a Michigan State alumni to give credit and kudos to the University of Michigan, 
I'd also recommend if you're in the Midwest or the Great Lakes, uh, having a link on your phone or a favorite tab for the arbor or, uh, herbarium at University of Michigan. And Michigan Flora uh, is a fantastic source. I grew up there and uh, use it often. I'm just glad our football team beat them so that I can give a little bit of uh, acknowledgement back to uh, the other team in Michigan there. And you might want to create your own herbarium yourself. Uh, Carlos Linnaeus once said that an herbarium is better than any illustration and every botanist should have one. Now, if you are collecting plant material, again, you wanna make sure that you have permission and only collect when and where you have the permission to do so. You wanna limit your harvesting. You don't need tons of specimens um, out there. You also wanna know the intent of your herbarium. Are you just doing this for your own purposes or are you helping out with a larger community-based science project? And avoid the collection of rare and sensitive species. It's also important to think about timing and if this is a plant that's gonna be setting seeds soon or in seed, maybe you shake some of those seeds out uh, where you are collecting. It's important that you have the proper preservation and display of these specimens. And I've been fortunate enough to look through the herbarium at Kew Gardens, uh, one of the best herbaria in the world, um, and actually see specimens from Charles Darwin and Livingston and many others uh, uh, that were in Joseph Banks and many other uh, prominent botanists of their era. So how does field botany help me understand the ecosystem and ultimately my own landscape? Well, one of the big things that you get a chance to do while you're out there in the field is experience complementary plants within a community. So rather than just planting all milkweed, which we know milkweed is a great resource for our monarchs, what about some of the asters, some of the later blooming plants uh, that might also accompany uh, the same region uh, that the monarchs are in when the milkweed goes to seed? So it's important to see how these plants play uh, nicely with others, how they mac, uh, mac, uh, mix together and create a living tapestry. It's also important to explore how plants grow in nature. So certain plants uh, will thrive in areas where you have really lean soils. One good example is a warm season grass, big blue stem, that it looked amazing in the landscape. And I was like, oh, sweet, I'm gonna use this right in the landscape. Uh, and I took specimens out, I put them into a highly composted soil. Uh, they got much larger very quickly and then ended up flopping right over. So the ones that were in the landscape or the, the cultivated garden looked awful and the ones that were left to the wild and the ditches were growing amazingly well. And it was that inability that I had at the time to recognize that they did not need fertile soils. In fact, they wanted stripped down soils. So by eliminating some of the organic matter, uh, I had a much beautiful, much more beautiful stand of big blue stem. It's also important to understand the function a plant provides within the ecological, ecological context. Is this helping to absorb some of the groundwater? Is this a plant that's a primary nectar source or secondary nectar source for a uh, insect that you're interested in? Is it a plant that provides a food source as well? Uh, am I going to look for things in the wild uh, that might uh, be resistant for, for deer pressure, for um, woodchucks, for squirrels? Uh, one of the best things I can do is go out in nature where there is an abundance of those creatures and see how the plants respond. So something like a button bush might have a little bit of browsing on it, but it'll flush right back even more. Um, that's a really important thing for me as a landscape designer to know because I can now use button bush and know that after heavy browsing, uh, it will flush back out and be totally fine. Um, where there's other plants that might not be as resilient around heavy deer pressure. Uh, I, it also gives you an opportunity to appreciate the anthropogenic effects on nature. Uh, you can see how human disturbance oftentimes is followed up with the per, pervasiveness of invasive species uh, and also how changing water tables on sites has a dramatic effect on the flora. It provides an intersectional perspective and also balance. And so if you see uh, in the photo on the right here, uh, John Mannion, uh, a fantastic uh, southeastern botanist uh, walking along Almond Rock. It brings this all into perspective. So here where you have a very limited amount of water, 
You'll also have uh, a very, very shallow root uh, zone for some of the trees, shrubs and forbs. So you'll notice there's pockets that might have a little bit more uh, access to soil. But in these tiny little pits, these little ecosystems, there is a plethora of activity. And what's important uh, to note here is that that flowering plant, Dimorpha smallii, was incredibly fragrant. I, will have, I have to tell you, this was one of the most fantastic experiences I've had botanizing in the field uh, with uh, Brandon Fuller, who's a great botanist out in North Carolina, Taylor Williams out in Louisiana, and John Mannion. You could not walk two feet without smelling the sweet fragrance, which is also a great supply of pollen for our bees. But what's more important here when I look at how can I utilize this information in my own garden, I know that if I wanted to plant this plant, I might find the perfect spot for it somewhere within a uh, scree garden or maybe even a crevice garden like what you see here at Juniper Level in North Carolina, providing that red uh, color throughout the season, pollen source for bees, and also a plant that will fill a lot of the cracks and crevices where I might have an inch or even less than an inch of soil reserve. Trying to encourage an ecosystem or ecosystems approach to landscape design blends our need and our desire for aesthetics and beauty with the importance of function within the system itself, our design, our overall design intent and what we wanna do with the space and the ecological services provided by our plants. And it's at that middle point uh, that our combining of these four principles makes for the strongest plant selection. So while a plant might function perfectly, have great ecological services, it may not fit our desired intent or our uh, perception of beauty. So it is important to look very differently and through these multiple lenses when trying to think about what plants might work well in my landscape that I may have experienced out in the wild. So here's our case study. We're here at the Creamery, an incredible place in Kennett Square, and I'm looking at the soils right here, and there's a lot of barren earth. I noticed that I have some blue stem grasses, I've got some Amsonia, but maybe I wanted a tree or shrub that I could put in this space, or even a forb, that would help with some of the challenges that I'm having as water moves in from the parking lot, as I get salt spray from the road, as I experience fluctuations in uh, levels of moisture in the soil. So we're going to play a little bit of botanical CSI. So here we have uh, our components. We're looking for salt tolerance, plants that can survive variable wet conditions, and those with the ability to withstand the heat and humidity being re re refracted from the parking lot and also that are ubiquitous in the Atlantic. So I want to look for a coastal community in the floodplain. Plants with wide distribution uh, in hotter zones are going to make them more apt to be part of my plant palette. So I'm already looking at coastal, meaning that I'm going to have the persistence of salt and salt inundation or salt spray. I'm going to look for variable wet conditions, the edges of these areas. So they're not standing water all the time. They're not dry. They're getting periodic uh, influxes of salt and or fresh water, and the ability to withstand heat and humidity. So I looked at the areas around and uh, the Delmarva Peninsula, a fantastic floristic region, uh, and one that I've enjoyed camping and hiking in uh, since I moved out here about eight years ago, is one area, and also Long Island, and thinking about what's growing on the south shores of Long Island, where they might get a lot of salt spray, salt inundation, and it's actually uh, a bit warmer zone than where I'm at in Philadelphia. So I went out into the cattails and large grasses and even Phragmites looking for what grows in the areas that meet the criteria. When I was there, I saw things like Ilix opaca, not necessarily well known for salt tolerance. In fact, many uh, references will say that it's a little bit salt intolerant. But being out there and seeing large specimens growing in this coastal community 
made me question what I had read about the species and maybe it would be a little bit more tolerant than what I had thought of in the past. I also found this charcoal cracked bark of Diospora's Virginiana with a common persimmon, which I thought, ooh, this would be fun. I, not only would I have a, a strong tree, I would also have a little bit of a fruit resource uh, there as well. Along the rest of my hike, I ran across some alder, some birch, very specialized birch. Some do well in, in salt and some do not. Plethora and sweet gum or liquid ambar. Okay, and those are a little bit higher up. They weren't as close to the shoreline as the Elixopaca and the Diosporus. And then I went deeper into the shoreline and I found things like Aronia arbutifolia, a red chokeberry. Juniperus virginiana, eastern red cedar, very well known for its salt tolerance. And another plant that I think deserves all the credit it never gets, Bacchus halimifolia, the groundsel tree. Uh, this plant has a wide distribution all the way from uh, the northern mid-Atlantic all the way down to the southern tip of Florida, uh, as I've seen it as far south as Key West. And it wasn't on vacation, it was growing there very happily. Uh, in the plant community there. So I have a bunch of different options here of things that I might look for. And I'll then balance the aesthetics, the function, and uh, the ecological services to the space, as well as my design intent. So if I go with a persimmon, it's gonna be a large towering tree and I would still need to put something underneath it, most likely, uh, and one that would present a lot of shade for the parking lot, but might be a little bit too large for the area that I'm looking at. The Alexopaca, very similarly, maybe I don't want something there in the winter, but if I did, I might look for a cultivar or selection that might be a little bit shorter. Um, Bacchus hemifolia, great plant, will spread uh, as well. Its primary interest is in the fall, so I'd wanna make sure that if I was plugging this into the landscape that I would have some spring and summer interest beyond this plant. Aronia arbutifolio, one that provides nice fall berries would be a nice touch, especially during the Christmas market that they normally hold there. Uh, a little bit smaller stature, good fall color, not much in terms of the uh, bloom. It's not the prettiest bloom in the world. It is nice, it's white uh, and is slightly fragrant. It just doesn't last very long. Or Junipers virginiana, which I know is an incredibly stress tolerant species. One that survives in the driest to dry, the wettest uh, conditions as well as well as those with salt and uh, high heat. So I have a lot of different options there and then it's up to me as the designer or the caretaker of the landscape to put all of those plants through the lens to ultimately find the perfect plant for this spot. I hope that exercise was a way to uh, help articulate why it's important to go out into the field and see where th these plants are growing, how they're relating to other plants and how this might be advantageous as a gardener to try to figure out how to integrate them into our landscape. The next case study, here's another botanical CSI. And for those of you that live around the Philadelphia region, this is a really exciting uh, uh, property. This is the Bondsville Mill in Downingtown. And you're seeing Michael Aldefer and David Culp in the background and landscape design, uh, designer, artist and landscape architect, Kristen Ryan here in the middle all helping out with a new planting and what was once an industrial uh, factory. So this is a really cool place. Um, and what's interesting about the site here is you will see some of those extremely tolerant plants like Iris ver uh, Versicolor. You'll see uh, Juniperus Virginiana in the background. There are some persimmon, there's some oak, um, and we've also planted um, some Lakothwi and some other plants, but there's some areas that need a little bit more attention. And those areas are um, alongside the cliffs that have stone, maybe even some crushed concrete or crushed concrete gravel that might have a little bit more of a chalkier pH and a little bit less of a soil resource. So let's put our thinking cap on and let's go down the road of another botanical CSI. So for this one, I'm looking at a plant that could tolerate an extremely shallow soil reserve. So this might be two inches, three inches, or even an inch. Typically in the garden, pretty, pretty difficult um, spot uh, to find plants. Things that might grow along cracks or crevices uh, are ones that I might be looking for there. 
potential for alkaline deposits from crushed concrete being prevalent on the site. Now, I normally do soil testing and I encourage you to do that with all the different sites that you'll be working with as a gardener, as a landscaper, and as a steward of the land. So uh, definitely take that into consideration. And if you have pockets of alkalinity next to acidity, um, you get a different plant palette. So if I was looking for things that are just going to survive in alkaline environments, I might look for areas where there's marl or limestone deposits, uh, areas around quarries, looking at things like lakeside daisy when I was back in Michigan, or plants that are um, extremely uh, uh, adept to these alkaline communities. I also need to make sure that whatever I'm looking at in terms of my plant palette, that is the ability to survive in extreme wet and dry conditions. So looking at the site itself, it's sloped. So it might go through relatively dry periods, but it is also next to what was a lower race or an upper race. Uh, so it's an area that can hold water. That's why you'll see the iris versicolor a little bit further down in the uh, canal. I also wanted to make sure that I was fitting within the design intent of using primarily native plants and a matrix design and looking and giving preference to some that are hyper local. So now I'm in a position where I'm like, okay, these are the critical factors that I'm looking at. Where might I go to find plant material? So I'm looking for something that's regionally close, an area where there's shallow soil reserves, where there's potential for alkaline deposits from crushed concrete, which also might be limestone deposits that are naturally occurring from glaciation, and the ability to survive in extreme wet and dry conditions. Well, I settled on the area along the Susquehanna River. Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with this region, it has some of the best spring wildflowers. Uh, really an incredible place. Uh, I go out there relatively frequently. It's fantastic to hike. It's only about an hour away from where I live. Uh, so during the pandemic, I made frequent spots, uh, stops at Pinnacle Overlook, Kelly's Run, and many of the other great natural places to visit in Lancaster County and Susquehanna County. So for this, I went to um, Shanks Ferry, uh, knowing in my mind uh, that this is an area that has extremely shallow deposits uh, of soil along some exposed rock. And it's important when you're hiking or when you're botanizing to look for plants in those crevices, those cracks, those spots that we normally would think of as being extremely difficult to survive in. I used to tell my students all the time, plants are in the business to survive and thrive. And anything that we do to get in their way, uh, they will try to find a way to move around. That might be that they spread by seed or by runners. Uh, it might be that they adapt themselves to go dormant at certain times. There's all these plant adaptations. They want to live, they want to survive, they want to thrive, they want to flower, make seeds and have offspring, carry on their plant legacy. So anything that is living in these very difficult spots are ones that are gonna be a little bit more apt to being used in more of an urban, uh, suburban uh, landscape that might have really stripped soils or poor drainage. So here we have a crowd favorite. Everybody knows this one. This is Columbine, the Aquilegia. Uh, really fantastic plant. It's got great spring into summer interest. Um, it's one that actually in the landscape, if you cut it back, it might flower again, um, but one that can also proliferate and spread, which would be great in this uh, uh, opportunity. I also found this white plant that's growing out here that we'll talk about in a little bit. You have some bed straw going through. There was uh, Virginia bluebells. There's jewelweed that you can see kind of in the background. Um, there were actually some trillium nearby, all really great plants uh, that were doing very well in this community. So I looked at three other ones other than the columbine, and I looked at sedum ternatum or wild stone crop. Most people don't know this plant, um, but those of you that do know it, it makes a fantastic green mulch, a good covering for your beds. Uh, and it's one that is more of a woodland species of uh, sedum that's gonna grow in dappled light 
uh, to almost shade, which is surprising considering we normally think of sedum as being a full, hot, blazing sun plant. This one is native. It creeps on the ground, slightly stoloniferous, uh, and is one that can make a mat over time, but doesn't necessarily spread incredibly rapidly. So it's one that if you are looking for a manicured or uh, easily controlled plant in your landscape, might be a fantastic choice. Flowers white a little bit after the columbine into the summer. So it kind of carries this from the spring season into the summer. We also saw Macranthes virginiensis, the early saxifrage and its white flowers making little rosettes, pushing forth to this delicate white flower that happens towards the end of spring. Another plant and one that's becoming more and more popular, and it pains me to say how much I'm starting to come around to this plant, is Pacara aria. I tease David Culp often as he's used it in his meadow, and I've said, boy, that's playing with fire because it really will go just about anywhere, which in this case might not be a bad thing to get quick coverage to limit the amount of uh, runoff that I might have. So Pacara aria is a golden flowered ragwort. So golden ragwort, the other thing that's nice about it is that its foliage persists throughout the year, which is very important when I'm looking at that space. It would be nice to have Virginia bluebells. It would be nice to have some of our trillium, but their foliage due to their ephemeral nature might not stay up long enough to detract some of the uh, potential erosion that I'll get from rainfall. So when I look at these three plants and the aqualegia, and I put them to the test, I look at their aesthetic value, which all of those have beautiful flowers, could create a nice carpet and mat of flowering late spring interest into summer interest. And I failed to mention that Pacara aria of the golden ragwort also has purple fall color um, and can act more as a ground cover. A little bit faster growing. So in terms of function, in terms of what I need from them, I'm thinking about limiting erosion. I'm thinking about the ability to persist and thrive in those conditions. I then look at the ecological services. All of these plants have uh, pollinators that will appreciate having them there. Uh, they also provide opportunities uh, for um, us to appreciate them as well. And they will um, provide opportunities for um, overwintering uh, populations through the Pacara uh, and the um, other uh, insects that might be living within its foliage, uh, insects and invertebrates living within its foliage throughout the winter months. So it also help he, uh, keep the soil from fluctuating temperatures by being uh, there up all year round. Then I think about the design intent of the space itself and see if that fits in. But the one thing I did forget was we focused a lot on the spring and it's important to make sure that I might have something going on in the fall. So maybe I'll look at the asters and that family of plants in the composite family uh, to see if there's some heath asters or New England asters that might also do well in those conditions. So ultimately, when I look back at the site, I go through that lens. And in this case, I would select just about all those plants and making them a community or a fabric uh, to kind of move throughout those rock crevice spaces. So it's giving me some opportunities to create persistent foliage, to promote spring interest and fall interest in the flowering of the landscape. And it all came from a single trip to Shanks Ferry to see some super cool plants amongst the beautiful rock outcroppings. So hopefully that was a helpful exercise. So what are some of the lessons that I've learned from the field being out and botanizing that helped me become a better landscape designer and gardener? I never take height, width, and spread maximums as the gospel truth. And you can see that here as I hug a giant Nyssa that's in a hummock out in the Pine Barrens near US Silica. This plant is historic. It's a massive tree. It's part of a forest that even Harvard has studied as being one of the older forests along the East Coast. And then I'm situated here uh, to uh, be in an area uh, in this swamp where it's inundated with water 300 days out of the year mainly. Uh, we had to wear waders to get through. Uh, the ice 
uh, covered hummocks here in the middle of winter. It's an area that is relatively lean in terms of having a top layer of really strong organic matter, but underneath it, it's relatively anaerobic and not very um, uh, great in terms of the pools that are there. And then underneath it are large, large deposits of silica sand. Uh, next to me over here, I have a Magnolia virginiana uh, to one side and Elix apaca uh, mixed within. And that Magnolia virginiana is one that normally I would have only thought of as going 20 feet tall in the landscape and maybe 15 to 20 foot tall or wide. Now I know they grow far bigger than ever anticipated. And Anissa that normally you think of as being 20 or 30 feet tall might be an 80 footer uh, in our uh, persistent natural landscape. I also learned that Clethra is a rock star. I have seen clathra in some of the weirdest, oddest crevices, cracks, streams, dry air areas. I never really appreciated how versatile clathra is in the landscape. Um, and while it might not be the biggest showstopper in the world, I can also tell you that it provides an absolute fantastic fanfare for our bees as it flowers in the late summer and it gets incredible fall color. So I've got gar garnered a new appreciation from clathra. I've learned there's so much diversity in the field that's not represented in our commercially available plant palette and I encourage you to find and seek out those that are ethically growing native plants and see how they might fit into your landscape because many of these plants deserve a place at the table too, much like this beautiful pink blush may apple or potophyllum at the home of botanist Mike Slater, an expert from Reading, Pennsylvania or maybe it's this beautiful variegated Pernelia that was found on the side of the road in the Poconos on a recent trip with Ethan Kaufman that will catch your eye, garner new attention, fit the aesthetic of the landscape, and maybe encourage people to think a little bit differently about our native plants. Lesson hard learned, don't forage too close to the paths. One might be because people have trampled through those areas, but they also might have dogs or pets, and you don't wanna be in the spray zone. When you're eating something like this Gaultheria procumbens or this amazing tea berry or winter fresh, that minty freshness that gives you just a little bit of extra energy while hiking. Timing is everything. So here I am with Phil Collins enjoying a beautiful stand of white fringed orchid. This is out in the Poconos areas as well. Uh, and it's a plot that if you would have been there two weeks later, you would have never known that there were orchids on site. And by orchids on site, you can tell uh, with the smiles of Carrie Wiles and Arden Pontash of North Creek Nursery, they are absolutely abundant. So one of the largest populations I've ever seen. And one of the other things is to not discredit some of the areas that you're seeing back here, where you might have a utility corridor or some gravel roads or highly tra trafficked areas. They have some gems in them for sure. Another lesson from the field is dress for all conditions. So while it might not be fun to walk around in your muck boots all day, uh, Ethan and I were in an incredible swamp out in the Poconos here. And it was very vital that we had dry feet for our journey. So it's important to think about what your footwear is as it's the basis of keeping you warm or cold or dry throughout your experience. And speaking of that experience, I encourage you all to share your time out botanizing, talk with other experts, learn about some of the unique plant communities that you may have overlooked. Things like seed box, things like Mimulus elegansis or the blue monkey flower are plants that I was unfamiliar with that I was exposed to through working with native plant groups and botanizing. And they've become an incredible resource as I develop rain gardens. And I can do a whole talk, in fact, I do a whole talk on what native plants should and could be used in rain gardens. Things like Cornisomum uh, or the silky dogwood uh, as well. Plants that have the potential because of the role that they play in the natural world that they would be great candidates for rain gardens. Take a plowfy. This was a, a term that I was exposed to through uh, working with Seed Your Future. That is a plant selfie. Um, Maybe you're interested in contributing to community science data collection with iNaturalist. And uh, iNaturalist, for those of you that don't use it, 
is a great way to share your journeys in the natural world with those around you. You could join a botanizing or native plant group or make friends on social media. You might even want to volunteer and help with plant monitoring or a survey. But ultimately, whether you're looking for uh, adventure or chances to go out in nature, uh, I highly encourage you to share that experience with those around you. For all of us to progress further as we look for ways to emulate nature and our own landscapes and seek harmony and balance between the natural and built world, I think we would all benefit from opting outside and spending more time hiking, exploring, and taking the time to botanize. Whether it's the excitement of finding your first orchid in the wild, like what we just saw there with Danielle, or if you're a seasoned professional and unlock a new palette, salt tolerant species to use in your health strip designs, there's beauty in the unwavering ability of mother nature to weave a living tapestry. There's something amazing and truly comprehending how fortunate we are to have a moment in the solitude of nature. I thank you all for your time this afternoon. I welcome any questions and here is my contact information. Love to uh, see you all if you make your way up to Longwood Gardens for a class or a visit. And thank you again, Cynthia and the team at Smithsonian for this incredible opportunity. I'm very humbled to talk to your audience. That was terrific, Matthew. Thank you. You have given us, given us lots to think about, but you also have given our biggest secret. People that are involved in horticulture are passionate about plants. We don't just go and work on them from nine to five. We're doing it all the time. And the reminder to botanize so you understand what a plant behaves, looks like, does, what its companions are when they are in situ is the biggest secret that we use to make our gardens look beautiful, functional, attract pollinators, all those wonderful attributes that many of our plants do in our gardens. So I highly recommend that people follow your lead and go out there and see what's there. You can go as wild as the Grand Tetons like I did this summer and uh, learned about new plant palettes or just in your own little uh, parks around you and your backyard. So thank you for that. I can't, I can't stress enough how important it is to go out and see what plants do in the wild and take that information home, not the plants home, but take that information home to be able to use in your garden. So one thing I, that you didn't tell us, what, what did you choose uh, for the, the spot in the creamery uh, to be able to plant? What was it? We're all dying to know. Still We're, haven't chosen yet. Still haven't uh, chosen. That, that one's TBD. That's a, a really fun place that we're doing some work with at Longwood Gardens. We have a plantology on tap series there. And I know um, I, I might even change it up and, and, and suggest that they would. Um, oh, you want us to vote? Laura, do it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, feel free. If you guys want to vote on what you'd like, I can share that with them. Um, I just chose that as an opportunity to look at uh, an area that, that presents a challenge in the landscape that you could solve by going out and botanizing. The yeah. other plant that I didn't mention, which is one that I was going to put in the lessons learned, is how versatile Itea virginica is yeah. or, or sweet spire. And that would be a plant that I highly would, would, would highly recommend for that area as well. Um, although it's not amazingly great with salt. It does perfectly fine, and that's what the literature says. It does perfectly fine and has been in our uh, parking lots at Longwood for many, many years. Mm -hmm. It's nice as a cutback and would provide that nice fall color for them as well. Yeah, so Laura, if you want to add IT in there as a, as a voting <laughs> option, uh, go for it. <laughs> well, I should have thought about that. Do some polls at the end. But I like Baccarus. I mean, to me, that is uh, mm -hmm. something that's often overlooked. Uh, we see it all the time along the roadsides right now, driving up to Pennsylvania along 95. And it's a fabulous plant. Why don't we use it in our gardens more often? And since it's a brewery, why not have persimmons there? Uh, yeah. Even though they're tall, because then you can have persimmon, persimmon tasted beers. I mean, that uh, it sounds a little weird, but we're in the fall. No, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great to me. I'm like, you want to do it as a cider? Are we doing something yeah. sweet? Are we going with like a blonde with a yeah. persimmon finish? I um, think that's great. It beats pumpkin even, spice. 
That's could, for sure. Yeah, definitely. That could be the new <laughs> pumpkin spice. We're, we're onto something here, Cynthia. Okay. I, I want some uh, part of the stocks when you sell, start selling. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm looking to see what else people have been asking. Uh, Peggy from um, Monticello mm -hmm. talking about uh, she finds uh, uh, Pacaria doesn't like it when we have long dry periods in her garden. What do you suggest? Yeah, Pacara is one that, um, and, and greetings to you, Peggy. She's amazing. She's one of the best uh, uh, horticulturists out there. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the on the uh, program today. Uh, it is one that can dry out in the summer for sure. Um, so supplemental watering uh, is one thing you might want to think about. Um, also, plants find where they're happy. Mm -hmm. And that is one that definitely would find where it's happy. So you might plant it in one spot. It might dry up a little bit in the summer go to seed and then kind of spread out throughout the space um, mm -hmm. and find its own niche. Uh, as I, as I said earlier, my, uh, with my students when I was in Ohio, I used to say plants are in the business to, to, to live, uh, to thrive and strive, uh, to, to make sure that they're going to make it through. And one of the great ways they can do that is by spreading their seed. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I also found it appreciated a little bit of shade in the summertime, which kind of mm -hmm. goes counter to what you think of, but we're so hot and humid here uh, as you are up in Longwood area too, that sometimes you just have to step outside the box and figure out what works best for your situation. I love the fact that you say, don't ever trust the, the plants don't read the books. They don't know how tall they're supposed to be. I have so many plants that have outgrown uh, what they said that they were supposed to do. And I yell at them all the time. Why didn't you listen to your book? Uh, but that's okay. Then you learn something new uh, to be able to use. So with 10 minutes left, uh, we don't have any more questions popping up. So I want to ask you, where's mm -hmm. the favorite place that you've gone to be able to, that you can share with us? I don't want you to share oh, yeah. Yeah, secrets. Totally. Uh, where, where do you recommend we start to visit in, in addition to the areas that you showed us? Yeah, uh, I think starting close to your home is one of the most important and most overlooked areas. Uh, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I, I traveled internationally. I would travel frequently to very far off lands. And I oftentimes overlooked what we had in terms of uh, the next neighboring property from, from, from me here is at Natural Lands at Cheslin. And I was out there walking every single day um, and, and trying to get out and hike every day here and really appreciate the flora that's right next door. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd highly, highly recommend you to, to hop on something like All Trails and see what's out there for hiking um, and what's available. Uh, the, other, the other thing I did, I got an opportunity to do is I got a chance to see some of our orchid conservation project in action with Peter Zale and Mike Slater and getting a chance to go to places like Noldy Forest and seeing um, odd, uh, you know, the, the wild pagonia. If you've never seen that orchid, mm -hmm. blow your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting to see them and experience them in the wild was pretty amazing. Um, and the Pine Barrens. So I go to the Pine Barrens once a week. Uh, to, on average, I, I try to get out to the Pine Barrens once a wow. week. Um, there, Franklin Parker Preserve is an incredible resource, very vast, uh, expansive, former agricultural fields. So a lot of them were cranberry bogs. So you have that acidic soil uh, mixed next to um, some hardwood forests. They did some burning there recently and you get to see the resurgence there. Uh, Packham Pond uh, is Great. If you've never seen Saracenia, that's a great spot to yeah. see them. Um, just be respectful of the fact that they are rare plants um, as well. Um, those are some of my favorite spots within the Pine Barrens itself. I really enjoy the Pygmy Pine Forest, uh, which is in Warren Grove, and there's some trails that you can find on that. Um, just be careful when you're, when you're there. Um, you can easily get disoriented. It's the same plant. Pinus rigida, as far as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, the preserve is Franklin Parker Preserve, Lori. Um, really amazing spot. And there is a reservoir, Bald Eagle Reservoir, right nearby that's really, really fun. Speaking of like the broad spectrum of the United States, the Fakahatchee and the Everglades is a strong part of my heart. Mm -hmm. um, I watched the Marjorie Taylor uh, Douglas uh, discussion, the, the River of Grass. Uh, that that documentary and I was just like blown away Be being able to know that I've been experienced uh, botanizing trips to the Everglades and I want to thank John Mannion for that. Um, I saw 23 orchids in, a w in one day, uh, different species of orchids. Not that orchids are the only thing I care about and I understand <laughs> they're charismatic 
uh, as well. Um, I saw Brenda's question, what about Michigan? So my home state, uh, one of my favorite places to go is the Manitou Islands. If you've never um, been, North and South Manitou Island uh, are off the coast in Michigan, uh, in Lake Michigan. Uh, I used to go there for Labor Day when I was a grad student just to decompress. It's carry in, carry out. It's very, uh, very fun. Good foraging out there if you're a forager. Uh, I also really like Hartwick Pines in the in the lower the lower part of the state, the lower peninsula. It's near Gaylord. Uh, majestic virgin stands of white pine uh, and uh, hemlock out there. Really interesting spot. Um, and then anywhere along the West Coast, I, I'm very partial to the Lake Michigan shoreline. The Upper Peninsula is one of the most fantastic places you'll ever go. Uh, the whole area near Tequamanan Falls out that way uh, also has some great botanizing as well as uh, there's one state park. I wanna say it's Duncan State Park. It's all the way, it's just south of Mackinac Island. And that's, that's a pretty fantastic landscape there. And seven bridges near Traverse City and Mackinac Island in the main part uh, has some fun trails too near Arch Rock. So yeah. I, I love Michigan. Uh, if you've never been, highly recommend it. Yeah, I, there's so many great places out there. If you're here in our local area, I highly recommend you join the Native Plant Society for Maryland or Virginia or Delaware, uh, because they go on some very awesome uh, trips that you might not have heard of. One of my favorite places I found on one of those trips was Balls Bluff, which is an old uh, Civil War battlefield area that was preserved because it's right there along the Potomac. And I have never seen so many beautiful spring plants. So you mm -hmm. just have to uh, talk to the people that go on those trips on a regular basis and follow along with them because they're going to show you the best trails to go on to and uh, remind you to practice good behavior when you're out in those areas. I have woods behind me that I like to walk through, but sometimes I'm afraid to step because there's so many wildflowers that I don't want to step. I'd like to uh, build some bridges over the areas so I'm not crushing anything. So please, when you're out there botanizing, take your time. Don't take mm -hmm. the fast walkers. Take all the walkers with you that are going to do uh, the same uh, speed that you're going to do. And in that case, with my husband, I'm finally teaching him to slow down a little bit so that we can see the things. But take care of the areas that you're walking in. Take out whatever you're bringing in. Don't leave mm -hmm. anything behind, including footsteps if you can. And be kind. So... The other thing I'd mentioned too, is you, you touched on those native plant groups and I'm a national board member for wild ones. And if you're not familiar with them, they're a nationwide uh, native plant advocacy group and their uh, local chapters do a lot of activity. I used to take trips to Nichols Arboretum at University no. of Michigan every year to do a fall color tour. And I, I kind of miss that. It was a ton of fun, um, but, but really um, being active in those groups and having good mentors uh, Denise Gehring was one of the one of really my gateway from ornamental horticulture into the natural world and really appreciating what's out there. I was trained classically as an ornamental uh, mm -hmm. horticulturist and going to the oak openings in Toledo with Denise and with the group of individuals that were out there really opened my eyes. Todd Crail at University of Toledo, that spot. I mean, it's like, oh, you moved to Toledo and people are like, man, you moved to Ohio. Like that's the biggest sacrilege is a Michigander. <laughs> and I'm like, if you spent one hour in the Oak openings, you'd never want to be anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's it's a totally uh, hidden uh, gem out there. And there's many more to be discovered. Mm -hmm. So we encourage you to botanize, to learn from nature, take it back, make your gardens more wholesome, more full, more healthy. Uh, more beautiful too. So thank you, Matthew. I hope to get you back again for another presentation. Uh, it's terrific. And we look forward to see what else Longwood has up uh, in their gardens and what they're doing. So see thank you, you very week. much. It was thank great. You. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Ross for raising Matthew. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>